The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith, Chapter 19 The boat approached Palermo Harbor slowly and tentatively, nosing its white prow gently through the floating orange peels, the straw, and the pieces of broken fruit crates. It was the way Tom fell to approaching Palermo. He had spent two days in Naples, and there had been nothing of any interest in the papers about the Miles case and nothing at all about the San Remo boat, and the police had made no attempt to reach him that he knew of. But maybe they had just not bothered to look for him in Naples, he thought, and were waiting for him in Palermo at the hotel. There were no police waiting for him on the dock, anyway. Tom looked for them. He bought a couple of newspapers, then took a taxi with his luggage to the Hotel Palma. There were no police in the hotel lobby, either. It was an ornate old lobby with great marble supporting columns and big pots of palms standing around. A clerk told him the number of his reserved room and handed a bellboy the key. Tom felt so much relieved that he went over to the mail counter and asked boldly if there was any message for Senor Richard Greenleaf. The clerk told him there was not. Then he began to relax. That meant there was not even a message from Marge. Marge would undoubtedly have gone to the police by now to find out where Dickie was. Tom had imagined horrible things during the boat trip. Marge beating him to Palermo by plane. Marge leaving a message for him at the Hotel Palma that she would arrive on the next boat. He had even looked for Marge on the boat when he got on board in Naples. Now he began to think that perhaps Marge had given Dickie up after this episode. Maybe she'd caught on to the idea that Dickie was running away from her and that he wanted to be with Tom alone. Maybe that had even penetrated her thick skull. Tom debated sending her a letter to that effect as he sat in his deep warm bath that evening, spreading soaps as luxuriously up and down his arms. Tom Ripley ought to write the letter, he thought. It was about time. He would say that he'd wanted to be tactful all this while, that he hadn't wanted to come right out with it on the telephone in Rome, but that by now he had the feeling she understood anyway. He and Dickie were very happy together, and that was that. Tom began to giggle merrily, uncontrollably, and squelched himself by slipping all the way under the water holding his nose. Dear Marge, he would say, I'm writing this because I don't think Dickie ever will, though I've asked him too many times. You're much too fine a person to be strung along like this for so long. He giggled again, then sobered himself by deliberately concentrating on the little problem that he hadn't solved yet. Marge had also probably told the Italian police that she had talked to Tom Ripley at the Ingolterra. The police were going to wonder where the hell he went to. The police might be looking for him in Rome now. The police would certainly look for Tom Ripley around Dickie Greenleaf. It was an added danger, if they were, for instance, to think that he was Tom Ripley now just from Marge's description of him and strip him and search him and find both his and Dickie's passports. But what had he said about risks? Risks were what made the whole thing fun. He burst out singing. Papa non veole, mama ne meno, come fremo fa l'amor. He boomed it out in the bathroom as he dried himself. He sang in Dickie's loud baritone that he had never heard, but he felt sure Dickie would have been pleased with his ringing tone. He dressed, put on one of his new non-wrinkling traveling suits, and strolled out into the Palermo dusk. There across the plaza was the great Norman-influenced cathedral he had read about, built by the English Archbishop Walter of the Mill, he remembered from a guidebook. Then there was Syracusa to the south, scene of a mighty naval battle between the Latins and the Greeks, and Dionysus's ear, and Taormina, and Etna. It was a big island and brand new to him, Sicilia, stronghold of Giulano, colonized by the ancient Greeks, invaded by Norman and Saracen. Tomorrow he would commence his tourism properly, but this moment was glorious, he thought, as he stopped to stare at the tall towered cathedral in front of him. Wonderful to look at the dusty arches of its facade and to think of going inside tomorrow to imagine its musty Swedish smell, composed of the uncounted candles and incense burnings of hundreds and hundreds of years. Anticipation. It occurred to him that his anticipation was more pleasant to him than his experiencing. Was it always going to be like that? When he spent evenings alone, handling Dickie's possessions, simply looking at his rings on his own fingers or his woolen ties or his black alligator wallet, was that experiencing or anticipation? Beyond Sicily came Greece. He definitely wanted to see Greece. He wanted to see Greece as Dickie Greenleaf with Dickie's money, Dickie's clothes, Dickie's way of behaving with strangers. But would it happen that he couldn't see Greece as Dickie Greenleaf? Would one thing after another come up to thwart him? Murder, suspicion, people. He hadn't wanted to murder, it had been a necessity. The idea of going to Greece, trudging over the Acropolis as Tom Ripley, American tourist, held no charm for him at all. He would as soon not go. Tears came in his eyes as he stared up at the campanile of the cathedral, and then he turned away and began to walk down a new street. There was a letter for him the next morning, a fat letter from Marge. Tom squeezed it between his fingers and smiled. It was what he had expected, he felt sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been so fat. He read it at breakfast. He savored every line of it along with his fresh warm rolls and his cinnamon-flavored coffee. It was all he could have expected and more. If you really didn't know that I had been by your hotel, that only means that Tom didn't tell you, which leaves the same conclusion to be drawn. It's pretty obvious now that you're running out and can't face me. Why don't you admit that you can't live without your little chum? I'm 
I'm only sorry, old boy, that you didn't have the courage to tell me this before and outright. What do you think I am, a small town hick who doesn't know about such things? You're the only one who's acting small town. At any rate, I hope my telling you that you hadn't the courage to tell me relieves your conscience a little bit and lets you hold your head up. There's nothing like being proud of the person you love, is there? Didn't we once talk about this? Accomplishment number two of my Roman holidays, informing the police that Tom Ripley is with you. They seemed in a perfect tizzy to find him. I wonder why. What's he done now? I also informed the police in my best Italian that you and Tom are inseparable and how they could have found you and still miss Tom I could not imagine. Change my boat and I'll be leaving for the States around the end of March after a short visit to Cape Munich, after which I presume our paths will never cross again. No hard feelings, Dickie boy. I just given you credit for a lot more guts. Thanks for all the wonderful memories. They're like something in a museum already or something preserved in amber, a little unreal as you must have felt yourself always to me. Best wishes for the future, Marge. Ooh, that corn at the end. Ah, clabber girl. Tom folded the letter and stuck it into his jacket pocket. He glanced at the two doors of the hotel restaurant, automatically looking for the police. If they thought that Dickie Greenleaf and Tom Ripley were traveling together, they must have checked the Palermo hotels already for Tom Ripley, he thought. But he hadn't noticed any police watching him or following him. Or maybe they'd given the whole boat scare up since they were sure Tom Ripley was alive. Why on earth should they go on with it? Maybe the suspicion against Dickie in San Remo and in the Miles murder too had already blown over. Maybe. He went up to his room and began a letter to Mr. Greenleaf on Diggy's portable Hermes. He began by explaining the Miles affair very soberly and logically because Mr. Greenleaf would probably be pretty alarmed by now. He said that the police had finished their questioning and that all they conceivably might want now was for him to try to identify any suspects they might find because the suspect might be a mutual acquaintance of his and Freddy's. The telephone rang while he was typing. A man's voice said that he was a tenente somebody of the Palermo police force. We are looking for Thomas Phelps Ripley. Is he with you in your hotel? He asked courteously. No, he is not, Tom replied. Do you know where he is? I think he's in Rome. I saw him just three or four days ago in Rome. He has not been found in Rome. You do not know where he might be going from Rome? I'm sorry, I haven't the slightest idea, Tom said. Priscado, sighed the voice with disappointment. Grazie tante, signor. Dimiente. Tom hung up and went back to his letter. The dull yards of Dickie's prose came out more fluently now than Tom's own letters ever had. He addressed most of the letter to Dickie's mother, told her the state of his wardrobe, which was good, and his health, which was also good, and asked if she had received the enamel triptych he had sent her from an antique store in Rome a couple of weeks ago. While he wrote, he was thinking of what he had to do about Thomas Ripley. The quest was apparently very courteous and lukewarm, but it wouldn't do to take wild chances. He shouldn't have Tom's passport lying right in a pocket of his suitcase, even if it was wrapped up in a a lot of old income tax papers of Dickie so that it wasn't visible to a custom inspector's eyes. He should hide it in the lining of the new antelope suitcase, for instance, where it couldn't be seen even if the suitcase were emptied, yet where he could get at it on a few minutes notice if he had to. Because someday he might have to. There might come a time when it would be more dangerous to beat Dickie Greenleaf than to be Tom Ripley. Tom spent half the morning on the letter to the Greenleafs. He had a feeling that Mr. Greenleaf was getting restless and impatient with Dickie, not in the same way that he had been impatient when Tom had seen him in New York, but in a much more serious way. Mr. Greenleaf thought his removal from Mangiabello to Rome had been merely an erratic whim, Tom knew. Tom's attempt to make his painting and studying in Rome sound constructive had really been a failure. Mr. Greenleaf had dismissed it with a withering remark, something about his being sorry that he was still torturing himself with painting at all, because he should have learned by now that it took more than beautiful scenery or a change of scene to make a painter. Mr. Greenleaf had also not been much impressed by the interest Tom had shown in the Burke Greenleaf folders that Mr. Greenleaf had sent him. It was a far cry from what Tom had expected by this time that he would have Mr. Greenleaf eating out of his hand that he would have made up for all Dickie's negligence and unconcern for his parents in the past, and that he could ask Mr. Greenleaf for some extra money and get it. He couldn't possibly ask Mr. Greenleaf for money now. Take care of yourselves, moms, he wrote. Watch out for those colds. She had said she'd had four colds this winter and had spent Christmas propped up in bed wearing the pink woolen shawl he had sent her as one of his Christmas presents. If you'd been wearing a pair of those wonderful woolen socks you sent me, you never would have caught the colds. I haven't had a cold this winter, which is something to boast about in a European winter. Moms, can I send you anything from here? I enjoy buying things for you.